Hi guys. I had a subscriber that asked me to do some more um, what I'm reading videos. So I wanted to show you my new favorite book. Oh my gosh, it's so fun. So I went to the library and I've been trying to find something that's a little deeper than just a, a gardening book. Something to reassure me that I'm not crazy and wanting to build this little food forest around my home. And what I found, can you see that? The Third Plate, Field Notes on the Future of Food by Dan Barber. And I even just love the cover because it, at first it, glance, it just looks like it's black. Then you get closer and it's dirt. It's soil that's on the cover. So the, the gist of this book is to talk through the fact that he is a chef and he is trying to find ways to eat locally and to have flavorful fabulous food well on this journey what he finds is a common thread that it is about the animals well-being the animals surroundings the the similarity between the animal's life and what it would have experienced in the wild that ends up being incredibly fatty nutrient dense flavor filled food that the secret is the timing that you butcher your animals, the way that you butcher your animals, making sure that they're not suffering, and um, the health of the land around these animals. And again, the reason I love this book is because it talks about fat. It talks about nutrition and it talks about health. Um, because when you, when you butcher an animal in the fall, they have this really, really thick layer of yellow fat around their intestinal organs. If you butcher them in the middle of summer, they don't have that. And it talks about how animals will gorge themselves at certain seasons in preparation for future stresses. And he talks about foie gras, foie gras, foie gras that is done without force feeding the animals. The, actually, the reason that they first found out about what foie gras is, is, is that wild geese in the fall, just before they migrated, would gorge. They would eat everything in sight. They would just triple in body weight because they were getting ready to have this long winter. And that the Egyptians, if I remember correctly, it was the Egyptians that saw these geese that were fattening themselves on dates and figs on the Nile. And butchered them and saw the difference in their livers. They had these livers that were enormous and had this, this, this lovely network of fat through their livers, um, that they did have fatty livers. And when people started to try and, and implement that artificially by force feeding animals all year round, what they just ended up with was fat, fat livers, not fatty livers, not incredibly nutrient dense livers, but just a lot of fat in their livers, which is different. And this guy went to Spain to see, you know, that the, what are they called? Jamon Iberia? What would it be called? It, it's those heritage hams. They have to eat, the pigs eat the acorns in Spain and they have these paddock systems with acorns and all this stuff. Turns out this guy was able to reproduce the foie gras effect naturally on the same property as what he was doing these pigs that have this uh, fat marbling through their hams and it's the same marbling that would happen in these goose livers and then they moved to another setting and this is so incredible they found the same thing happened with fish that there were these fish that they had set up um to imitate natural systems in Argentina. Is it Argentina? I'd have to look it up. Anyway, these bass would gorge themselves at a certain time of year or yeah. So gorge themselves at certain times of year that would make their um roe, their uh so like caviar, their egg sac, huge and fatty and beautiful that would have little networks of fat through it, like marbling. And so maybe that sounds crazy to all of you, but um, it was beautiful. It was this guy coming to the realization that um, good food 
was not sep you couldn't separate it from the health, well-being, and environment of the animal. And he did the same thing with seeds, talking about GMOs and about um, heritage, and also about naturally uh, bred wheat. That the wheat flour that we get in the store is dead. Pardon me, I have to sneeze. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, he talked about seeds and the flavor in seeds and the flavor in seeds because of the soil that they're grown in and the microbes and the microorganisms and all these plant rotations. And he talks about how, and, and this is why we store whole wheat instead of flour, is because when uh, commercial mills grain their uh, mill their grain. What they do is they remove they remove the germ, which makes it so that the flour is dead. It can't go rancid. If you're going to be cooking with whole wheat flour, you need to mill it cool before, like within minutes of using it, because it will go rancid within a matter of hours, because that wheat germ spoils. And now I've got to blow my nose. It's not lovely. Sorry, I'm trying not to sniff. Okay, so... Um, anyway, it was fascinating, and I loved this book, and it just gave me another push in the right direction. I think it will be impossible for me to implement it on my property in a way that will feed my family and give the animals the quality of life that they need. I only have an acre and a half. As I plant more more trees and have more ground cover and more density of my plants I will do better at the quality of life <sighs> but it's just not natural to have that many birds stuck in that small of a space and it's just not natural to have that many grazing animals stuck in that small of a space I can't really rotate fully so I think I will have to cut back on my number of animals and instead focus really hard on my vegetable production because um, if we can fill up on the vegetables then we don't need as much meat and um, so that's where I'm going with this particular book the other thing I wanted to tell you about was that I found oh what is it called something Republic podcast Republic free Republic it's a podcast site that has a whole bunch of amazing people that do podcasts. And the one that I have right now is So Edible, S-O-W Edible Permaculture. I really, really liked their um, their audio that I listened to. That It sounds like they're really doing something that is good and important. And darn it, Republic something. Let's go look that up and put it in the sidebar. Um, anyway, the third plate. And he is a little bit, um, uh, he's definitely not leaning towards vegetarianism, but he is leaning towards responsible agriculture and responsible consumption. For my family, if we are eating fruits and vegetables out of our own garden, the food goes much further than it does if we get it from the grocery store. And if we're growing our own, we have a tendency to eat actually very little meat because we just eat a lot of vegetables through the day. So that is my new plan. I am going to cut back on animals a lot because one of the reasons I have a hard time doing more gardening during the growing season is that I'm spending so much time taking care of animals. So I'm going to cut way back on everything. I think I'm probably only going to keep like five or six hens and the ducks. I really like the ducks because I have so much mulch and I need them to eat the slugs. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep up on the ducks, probably five or six ducks too. And one rooster and one drake so that they can continue to reproduce. And, um, I think I'm going to just keep the two rabbits. I'm going to breed them so that I make money on selling the babies. This year I sold them for $50 a piece which is a pretty good profit on a rabbit. And um, what else do I have? I think I will probably get geese in the spring because I do appreciate that they will eat grass and I don't want my goats up eating grass. So I'll probably put the geese, geese up front to eat the grass. And pigs. We have pigs from friends coming to rototill our front pasture because everything up there is just so compacted 
So I'll put lots of straw in there for them and see if I can't get them to dig it up and mulch it in and all that. So the only thing that I really feel like I'm behind on right now, I have grain for the ducks and the geese, ducks and the chickens. Um, I have to buy the rabbits only one bag at a time. Because if I buy more than that, it has a tendency to absorb moisture and then it loses its shape and they won't eat it. So I feel like I need at least one more ton of hay this winter, possibly two. And I need two or three tons of straw. One for bedding and then the other to put on top of mulch in the backyard because I know that the chickens and the ducks are going to make a mess of it. And it's good for the backyard to get stirred up a little bit every once in a while. It's good to keep it from getting compressed and getting stale. So the chickens do a good job of proofing things up and, and searching out bugs that the ducks aren't necessarily as good at chasing. And that is what we're doing right now. And I will see if I need to edit this for sneezes or if we can just let it go.